It's milk and biscuits time. Aladdin Story Part 9 The next day, the magician learned from the chief superintendent of the Khan where he lodged that Aladdin had gone on a hunting expedition, which was to last for eight days, of which only three had expired. The magician wanted to know no more. He resolved at once on his plans. He went to a coppersmith and asked for a dozen copper lamps. The master of the shop told him he had not so many by him, but if he would have patience till the next day, he would have them ready. The magician appointed his time and desired him to take care that they should be handsome and well polished. The next day, the magician called for the twelve lamps, paid the man his full price, put them into a basket hanging on his arm, and went directly to Aladdin's palace. As he approached, he began crying, who will change old lamps for new ones? As he went along, a crowd of children collected, who hooted and thought him, as did all who chanced to be passing by, a madman or a fool, to offer to change new lamps for old ones. The African magician regarded not their scoffs, hootings, or all they could say to him, but still continued crying, who will change old lamps for new ones? He repeated this so often, walking backward and forward in front of the palace, that the princess, who was then in the hall with the four and twenty windows, hearing a man cry something, and seeing a great mob crowding about him, sent one of her women slaves to know what he cried. The slave returned laughing so heartily that the princess rebuked her. Madam, answered the slave, laughing still, who can forbear laughing to see an old man with a basket on his arm, full of fine new lamps, asking to change them for old ones. The children and mob crowding about him so that he can hardly stir, make all the noise they can in derision of him. Another female slave, hearing this, said, Now you speak of lamps. I know not whether the princess may have observed it, but there is an old one upon a shelf of the Prince Aladdin's robing room, and whoever owns it will not be sorry to find a new one in its stead. If the princess chooses, she may have the pleasure of trying if this old man is so silly as to give a new lamp for an old one without taking anything for the exchange. The princess, who knew not the value of this lamp and the interest that Aladdin had to keep it safe, entered into the pleasantry and commanded a slave to take it and make the exchange. The slave obeyed, went out of the hall and no sooner got to the palace gates than he saw the African magician called to him and, showing him the old lamp, said, Give me a new lamp for this. The magician never doubted, but this was the lamp he wanted. There could be no other such in this palace, where every utensil was gold or silver. He snatched it eagerly out of the slave's hand, and thrusting it as far as he could into his breast, offered him his basket, and bade him choose which he liked best. The slave picked out one and carried it to the princess, but the change was no sooner made than the place rung with the shouts of the children, deriding the magician's folly. The African magician stayed no longer near the palace, nor cried any more, new lamps for old ones, but made the best of his way to his Khan. His end was answered, and by his silence he got rid of the children and the mob. As soon as he was out of sight of the two palaces, he hastened down the least frequented streets and, having no more occasion for his lamps or basket, set all down in a spot where nobody saw him. Then, going down another street or two, he walked till he came to one of the city gates, and pursuing his way through the suburbs, which were very extensive, at length reached a lonely spot, where he stopped till the darkness of the night as the most suitable time for the design he had in contemplation. When it became quite dark, he pulled the lamp out of his breast and rubbed it. At that summons, the genie appeared and said, What wouldst thou have? I am ready to obey thee as thy slave, and the slave of all those who have that lamp in their hands, both I and the other slaves of the lamp. I command thee, replied the magician, to transport me immediately, and the palace which thou and the other slaves of the lamp have built in this deity, with all the people in it, to Africa. The genie made no reply, but, with the assistance of the other genies, the slaves of the lamp immediately transported him and the palace entire to the spot whither he had been desired to convey it. Early the next morning, when the Sultan, according to custom, went to contemplate and admire Aladdin's palace, 
His amazement was unbounded to find that it could nowhere be seen. He could not comprehend how so large a palace, which he had seen plainly every day for some years, should vanish so soon and not leave the least remains behind. In his perplexity, he ordered the Grand Vizier to be sent for with expedition. The Grand Vizier, who in secret bore no goodwill to Aladdin, intimated his suspicion that the palace was built by magic and that Aladdin had made his hunting excursion an excuse for the removal of his palace with the same suddenness with which it had been erected. He induced the Sultan to send a detachment of his guards and to have Aladdin seized as a prisoner of state. On his son-in-law being brought before him, he would not hear a word from him, but ordered him to be put to death. The decree caused so much discontent among the people, whose affection Aladdin had secured by his largesse and charities, that the Sultan, fearful of an insurrection, was obliged to grant him his life. When Aladdin found himself at liberty, he again addressed the Sultan. Sire, I pray you to let me know the crime by which I have thus lost the favour of thy countenance. Your crime, answered the Sultan. Wretched man, do you not know it? Follow me, and I will show you. The Sultan then took Aladdin into the apartment from whence he was wont to look at and admire his palace, and said, You ought to know where your palace stood. Look, mind, and tell me what has become of it. Aladdin did so, and being utterly amazed at the loss of his palace, was speechless. At last, recovering himself, he said, It is true, I do not see the palace. It has vanished, but I had no concern in its removal. I beg you to give me forty days, and if in that time I cannot restore it, I will offer my head to be disposed of at your pleasure. I give you the time you ask, but at the end of the forty days forget not to present yourself before me. Aladdin went out of the Sultan's palace in a condition of exceeding humiliation. The lords who had courted him in the days of his splendor now declined to have any communication with him. For three days he wandered about the city, exciting the wonder and compassion of the multitude by asking everybody he met if they had seen his palace or could tell him anything of it. On the third day he wandered into the country and, as he was approaching a river, he fell down the bank with so much violence that he rubbed the ring which the magician had given him so hard by holding on the rock to save himself that immediately the same genie appeared whom he had seen in the cave where the magician had left him. What wouldst thou have, said the genie? I am ready to obey thee as thy slave and the slave of all those that have that ring on their finger, both I and the other slaves of the ring. Aladdin, agreeably surprised at an offer of help so little expected, replied, Genie, show me where the palace I caused to be built now stands, or transport it back where it first stood. Your command, answered the genie, is not wholly in my power. I am only the slave of the ring, and not of the lamp. I command thee then, replied Aladdin, by the power of the ring, to transport me to the spot where my palace stands, in what part of the world soever it may be. These words were no sooner out of his mouth than the genie transported him into Africa, to the midst of a large plain, where his palace stood at no great distance from a city, and, placing him exactly under the window of the princess's apartment, left him. Now it so happened that shortly after Aladdin had been transported by the slave of the ring to the neighborhood of his palace, one of the attendants of the princess Budir al-Budur, looking through the window, perceived him and instantly told her mistress. The princess, who could not believe the joyful tidings, hastened herself to the window and, seeing Aladdin, immediately opened it. The noise of opening the window made Aladdin turn his head that way, and perceiving the princess, he saluted her with an air that expressed his joy. To lose no time, said she to him, I have sent to have the private door opened for you. Enter and come up. The private door, which was just under the princess's apartment, was soon opened, and Aladdin conducted up into the chamber. It is impossible to express the joy of both at seeing each other after so cruel a separation. After embracing and shedding tears of joy, they sat down, and Aladdin said, I beg of you, princess, to tell me what has become of an old lamp which stood upon a shelf in my robing chamber. Alas, answered the princess, 
I was afraid our misfortune might be owing to that lamp, and what grieves me most is that I have been the cause of it. I was foolish enough to change the old lamp for a new one, and the next morning I found myself in this unknown country, which I am told is Africa. Princess, said Aladdin, interrupting her, you have explained all by telling me we are in Africa. I desire you only to tell me if you know where the old lamp now is. The African magician carries it carefully wrapped up in his bosom, said the princess, and this I can assure you, because he pulled it out before me and showed it to me in triumph. Princess, said Aladdin, I think I have found the means to deliver you and to regain possession of the lamp, on which all my prosperity depends. To execute this design, it is necessary for me to go to the town. I shall return by noon, and will then tell you what must be done by you to ensure success. In the meantime, I shall disguise myself, and I beg that the private door may be opened at the first knock. When Aladdin was out of the palace, he looked around him on all sides, and perceiving a peasant going into the country, hastened after him. And when he had overtaken him, made a proposal to him to change clothes, which the man agreed to. When they had made the exchange, the countryman went about his business, and Aladdin entered the neighboring city. After traversing several streets, he came to that part of the town where the merchants and artisans had their particular streets according to their trades. He went into that of the druggists, and entering one of the largest and best furnished shops, asked the druggist if he had a certain powder, which he named. The druggist, judging Aladdin by his habit to be very poor, told him he had it, but that it was very dear. Upon which Aladdin, penetrating his thoughts, pulled out his purse, and showing him some gold, asked for half a dram of the powder, which the druggist weighed and gave him, telling him the price was a piece of gold. Aladdin put the money into his hand and hastened to the palace, which he entered at once by the private door. When he came into the princess's apartment, he said to her, Princess, you must take your part in the scheme which I propose for our deliverance. You must overcome your aversion to the magician and assume a most friendly manner toward him and ask him to oblige you by partaking of an entertainment in your apartments. Before he leaves, ask him to exchange cups with you, which he, gratified at the honor you do him, will gladly do when you must give him the cup containing this powder. On drinking it, he will instantly fall asleep and we will obtain the lamp whose slaves will do all our bidding and restore us and the palace to the capital of China. The princess obeyed to the utmost her husband's instructions. She assumed a look of pleasure on the next visit of the magician and asked him to an entertainment, which he most willingly accepted. At the close of the evening, during which the princess had tried all she could to please him, she asked him to exchange cups with her and, giving the signal, had the drugged cup brought to her which she gave to the magician. He drank it out of compliment to the princess to the very last drop when he fell backward, lifeless, on the sofa. The princess, in anticipation of the success of her scheme, had so placed her women from the great hall to the foot of the staircase that the word was no sooner given that the African magician was fallen backward than the door was opened and Aladdin admitted to the hall. The princess rose from her seat and ran overjoyed to embrace him. But he stopped her and said, Princess, retire to your apartment and let me be left alone while I endeavor to transport you back to China as speedily as you were brought from thence. When the princess, her women and slaves were gone out of the hall, Aladdin shut the door and going directly to the dead body of the magician, opened his vest, took out the lamp, which was carefully wrapped up and rubbing it, the genie immediately appeared. Genie, said Aladdin, I command thee to transport this palace instantly to the place from whence it was brought hither. The genie bowed his head in token of obedience and disappeared. Immediately the palace was transported into China and its removal was only felt by two little shocks, the one when it was lifted up, the other when it was set down, and both in a very short interval.